Here are four surprising facts that the research has shown about learning. It's easy to think of tests as measurements, kind of like grabbing a thermometer to see how hot it is outside. We can put our thermometer anywhere we want, but it's not going to change the temperature of the air, at least not in any way that has practical consequences for us. That's certainly the way that people tend to think about tests in grade school and college, right? We work hard to learn something, and then the teacher gives us a test to measure how much we have learned. But because of the way that our brains work, it's very hard to measure learning without also impacting learning. Pretty much any experience you can think of that measures learning outcomes also impacts learning in some way. And tests in particular are potent learning events. For instance, I'm willing to bet that you would learn more from taking a test on the content of this video than you would if you rewatched this video again. Speaking of measurements, measuring learning is much more complicated than at first appears. One of the basic most replicated findings in research on learning is that immediate measures of learning are often deceptive. If at the end of this video I gave you a test on the content here, you would probably do okay. But say you took that same test a month from now instead of right after watching this video, well, then you might not do so great. Think about all the intervening things that are going to happen in that month. Think about what you're going to do immediately after watching this video when your brain will be trying to consolidate your memory of what you heard here. Think of all the other interesting things that you might hear about the research on learning by watching the other videos on my channel, for instance. You might think, well, everyone knows that we forget things sometimes, right? What's so counterintuitive about that? Complications to measuring learning outcomes go beyond the fact that we just forget things sometimes. Because if you're not measuring learning outcomes very effectively, you're going to get misimpressions about which studying and training methods are effective. Several of the training or studying methods that seem appealing because they give us the feeling of doing well or the feeling of learning are actually the methods that we want to avoid. Just because it felt easy to learn at one point doesn't necessarily mean that it is going to be easy to remember in the future. In fact, in many cases, making things easier is the exact opposite of what we want to do if we want to learn effectively. And we just talked about one of the classic cases of that, testing. Tests can feel hard and frustrating, but they are usually more effective for learning than rereading, which often feels safe and comfortable. There's been a search over the past 30 to 40 years about what really works in education. What's the best studying technique? What's the best teaching style? Well, it turns out that the best learning or instructional technique just depends. For one thing, it depends on your learning goal because if you have a slightly different learning goal, you would probably want to take a slightly different learning approach. But one of the key factors that influences the impact of learning experiences on students is their prior knowledge. Let me explain this with a short example. Often, giving someone multiple representations of the same idea is more effective than giving someone a single representation of that idea. So this is a chart that depicts constant acceleration over time. And this is a graph that depicts constant acceleration over time. Working with both together helps to strengthen the core idea of constant acceleration over time. It helps students understand what acceleration might mean, along with other examples, in the same way that two photos of the same person shed more light on what that person is about. But teaching with multiple representations doesn't always work. If you have low prior knowledge, multiple representations is like taking two photos of the same baffling object, right? If you don't understand something very well, then adding more elements to understand is usually not the best approach. Students with higher prior knowledge, by contrast, 
find it easier to interpret the representations and grasp the key underlying ideas. This fact has some interesting consequences. One of the things that makes addition and multiplication beautiful is that the order in which you add or multiply doesn't matter. But that is not the case with learning. Because our prior knowledge impacts every learning experience that we have, the order of those learning experiences matters. Traditionally, students learn how to add fractions before they learn how to multiply them. Procedurally, multiplying fractions is easy. You just multiply the numerators and multiply the denominators. But it's conceptually challenging. When you multiply two whole numbers, you get a bigger number. But when you multiply two fractions less than one, you get a smaller number than either of the two numbers that you started with. Addition has just the opposite problem. Conceptually, it's easy. You add two positive fractions and you get a bigger positive fraction. But procedurally, it's a pain. You have to find a common denominator, transform the fractions in terms of that common denominator, and then add the numerators up, and then you might have to reduce the fraction at the end. Many students struggle with adding fractions and even with fractions in general. Now, in one study, researchers flipped the traditional way of teaching so that one group of students learned fraction multiplication first, then learned fraction addition. This group ended up being better at both fraction addition and fraction multiplication. So doing nothing else but changing the order of the learning experiences can have profound effects on learning outcomes. But you can have profound effects on learning outcomes as well. There are students all over the world who would love to learn in the way that you do, but they don't have access to teachers or libraries or the internet. GiveInternet.org works with students in need by providing them with laptops and internet connections so that they can get an education and improve their lives and their communities. If you have the means, please consider making a donation, just like I do every month. They're a cool group of people, they're very transparent about what they do, and they work closely with the students that they support. You can learn more about them in the link below, and if you do choose to donate, please use my donation link where you will double the impact that you have. That's it. Thanks for watching. See you next time.